Welcome back. Today in the shop, we're going to talk about dust collection. That sounds good. Stick around. Hey and welcome to The Woodcrafter. I'm Andy Gile, and if you're new here, it's great to have you on board. Our mission is to inspire, educate and support you in your journey to becoming a better woodworker. Here on the YouTube channel, we do that through tool tips, tool reviews, setup, techniques, safe guides and just get together to have a jolly old chat. We have a website, www.thewoodcrafter.com and on there you'll find even more information as well as detailed project builds that take you step by step from design all the way through to producing something. So if you're not a subscriber and you're not a member of our community, subscribe now, whiz over to the website and grab yourself a free membership. And with that said, let's talk about dust. If you followed me for a while, you remember I bought a planar thicknesser. And at the time I had no dust extraction for the planar thicknesser. So I tried to get by by putting a standard shop vac against that device. Halfway through the coffee table series, I realised that was not a good idea. Now when I first tried out the shop vac, nice piece of cherry, build up thickness beautifully, shop vac did its job. When I threw projects in anger and the amount of milling I did on the coffee table, the shop vac exploded. It overheated, the plastic crown cracked and it was a beautiful plume, almost like snow of dust all through the workshop. Sort of kind of pointed out it probably wasn't the best idea. I've ever had. So I decided to go and buy some proper dust extraction. Now because I was mid-project I had very very little time to research what I was doing so a quick browse on YouTube showed me one thing there's not an awful lot of information about dust collection. Lots of videos of people installing pipes and earthing pipes and getting rid of static but nothing really explained to me what is dust collection? What's the difference between a shop vac? What's the difference between a dust extractor? When do you need them? How do you size them? How do you choose them? How do you get the right thing for your shop? How do you get considerations of the tools? So I went in blind and I just bought pretty much the first thing that was available to me in the shop that looked small and compact and the store said would do a good job. I think I bought the wrong thing. So in hindsight, I would have made a different decision. What I want to do in this video is talk you through some basic information that will help you if you're looking to put a dust extraction system into your workshop. Disclaimer, I am not an expert. I've researched, I've spent time, I've studied, I've taken advice from different people, and this is just a collection of my thoughts. Please, please, please go and get professional guidance from your local store if you're going to do something similar. But use this video as a reference point, a starter for 10, if you will. So let's start by looking at the different types of devices. You're going to come across a shop vac. Now, before all the festival fanboys start to scream inside the comments, this is not a shop vac, this is a high quality dust extractor. Yes, I know that. But the principles of how this works are based on a shop vac and we'll come back to that dust extraction brand shortly so stop shouting bear with me this here on the other hand is a dust extractor what's the difference put very very simply a shop vac has a low volume of air movement but the air moves incredibly quickly a dust extractor has a high volume of air coming through it that moves relatively slowly and that's the key difference between the two. Now people say to me what's best, what's the advantages over each of these things? The answer is nothing. Not one of them is best, not one has an advantage over the other. They're designed for a different purpose and when you understand that you can then answer the question for yourself, do I need a shop vac, do I need a dust extractor or do I actually need both? Let's start off by talking about the shop vac. Shop vac, shop vacuum. This works on the same principle as your household vacuum cleaner. Inside here, there's a chamber, and that chamber is relatively airtight. There's a motor inside here that's sucking air out of that chamber. It's creating a vacuum in that chamber. That's where it gets its name from. At some point, connecting into that chamber, is a hole and into that hole you put some sort of hose. So you've got a negative pressure inside here and a positive pressure 
outside here. So the positive pressure wants to fill the vacuum so the air flies down the holes. It works by vacuum. And what happens here is the air flies down the holes and it flies down the holes incredibly quickly. Low volume of air going through that hose, going through at a very, very high speed. Think about a typical mitre saw. On a mitre saw, I've got a blade that's spinning incredibly quickly. And that's taking small chips out of the material that I'm cutting. Those small chips are propelled at high speed into a dust collection port that then spews out the back here. That's creating a very fast spurt, but a low volume of waste. So coupling up with a device that can move a low volume of waste at high speed is probably a good idea. And that's why shop vacs are very, very good at working on hand tool, powered hand tool type devices. So think in terms of your router, your circular saw, your mitre saw, or your sander, etc. If you've got any device where the mechanism that cuts your material is throwing that directly into an extraction port at speed, low volume, high speed is a good way to go. Let's contrast that with something like the planar thicknesser. Yes, the plane thicknesser is still taking chips off, but those chips are not directed into an extraction port. Those chips are brought into a collection bucket inside the extractor itself, a hopper, if you will, and that's where your dust starts to collect. So you've got a high volume of waste, and it's much heavier. These are relatively small chips. I'm taking planing chips from a piece of material, so they're much heavier it's a much higher volume. So for a planar jointer type material, anything that's collecting inside a hopper, I want a high volume moving it away. I'm less concerned about keeping up with the speed of the device that's propelling chips at me. I want to clear that hopper, large volume, and that's where dust extractors are really, really, really great, because they're going to move a high volume of air relatively slowly, still quick enough, but relatively slowly away from that hopper. So these are incredibly good for shop machines. Think in terms of anything that's got that hopper on it, your planar jointer. Think in terms of a router table that's got the collection box underneath. Think in terms of a table saw where you've got the hopper underneath that's collecting the material that you then want to take away. That's where this thing comes in. So they're actually designed for a different purpose. Very, very portable, very, very good for power-based hand tools. Not so portable, very, very good for shop-built machines. And it's that simple, and I, it took me ages to actually work out what the difference was. Now, let me just address the Festool fan who sat there grumpy with me. Yes, this is also now termed a dust extractor, and this is also termed a dust extractor. And that's confused things considerably, and that's why at the start of the video, I use the term shop vac. This is working on a vacuum. This is not working on a vacuum. It's work working on air displacement. Now, the dust extraction label doesn't actually refer to if you're a vacuum device or an impeller device. And we'll talk about the impeller device in a second. Dust extraction talks about the ability of the device to extract dust from the air. Both of these, at some point, are spewing air back into the environment and both of them are sucking dust into the devices. So there's a filter involved, and that filter takes out that dust, so what comes back into the air is relatively clean. When you buy this device, it comes with a bag, not this filter, and the bag will give you an element of dust extraction, an element of filtration, but it will only take it down to about 30 microns. So anything smaller than 30 microns will be spewed back into your environment. This takes you down to about one micron, depending on the filter, there's an L-class and an M-class. An L-class filter, which is inside this one, is going to be great for general woodworking use. If you're using a lot of MDF or your, plas or your sanding plaster walls, any man-made product that's gonna give you a very, very fine dust, the M-class gives you a higher level of filtration. This is gonna filter about 99% of baddies out of the dust environment for you. I upgraded this, so this metal casing that you see here with the handle on top is an upgrade to the device 
that I bought. This will filter air down to one micron. Now it's between two and about six microns, and that's probably wrong, but it's somewhere around two to six microns that's damaging to you as a person. Yeah. You, but if you're breathing them in, this is where you're gonna to start to get your nose cloggy, your, your nasals are gonna to start to hurt, and over time, your lungs will start to get infected with dust. So it's a good idea to have any filtration system that takes you below that threshold. Both of these will do. So they are called dust extractors. It's a loose term. This is a shop vac. This works on vacuum. This works on impeller. You can see here on the bottom of this, there's a big motor. And sitting on top of that motor is an impeller inside here. All that happens is this impeller spins round and that sucks air into this connection here. That then throws the air into here and it creates a cyclone inside this bag and the heavy particles fall down into the bag and the dust comes up into the filter where it's filtered and clean air is expelled. So there's no vacuum involved in this at all, it's just basically an air mover just as a big propeller. Think about a fan in your bedroom in summer that's spinning and blowing air on you. Behind that fan, air is being sucked into the fan and blown out again. Exactly the same thing on a bigger scale. So in my dust setup, I'm going to have both of these devices. This one is going to be used for the powered hand tools, and this one is going to be worked for my big machines. I now want to talk a little bit more about a dust extraction system that's based on this type of device. Now remember, this is general advice, and I'm only going to talk about systems that are typically acceptable in a smaller shop like this one. I'm not gonna talk about big industrial systems. I guess the thinking and the theory is the same, but we're talking about small shops and the type of things that you may well be considering buying. So when you start to look at your device, you've obviously got the shop vac we've already spoken about, but then these sort of devices tend to be marked in horsepower. So you get one horsepower devices, one and a half horsepower, two horsepower, and three horsepower. Now, as well as having a horsepower rating, the thing that you need to think about is the air volume. And in the UK, that's measured in meter cubed per hour, so any metric system is going to be meters cubed per hour. That's talking about the volume of air that sucks into this port, not your entire system, this port, in ideal conditions, how much air is going to flow through that port every hour. The port itself comes in different sizes. This is a 100 millimeter port. You can get 150, 175, 200, and then the big industrial machines weighs bigger than that. And on some of these, you can step the ports up and down. So it's important that you understand the size of pipe you're going to use in your workshop environment, and the size of the port, and the meter cube per hour at that point. Let me show you what I mean. You can see that a one horsepower device typically has a 100 millimeter connection point, and it will bring in 1,000 meter cubed per hour. A one and a half horsepower also tends to have 100 millimeter connection holes, and that will bring in 1,500 meter cubed per hour. A two horsepower, however, can work with both 100 millimeter and 175, and at 100 millimeter, 1,200, and at a 175, 2,250. And a three horsepower tends to work at 175 millimetre and 300 millimetre, sorry, not 200. And that's 1,600 and 3,000. So you can see the difference at the size of the pipe made. If you were to buy a two horsepower device and you were to connect to it a 100 millimetre system, the actual movement of air is less than the one and a half horsepower at that same device. So straight away, there's a clue inside that. You've got to understand the size of pipe, the diameter of pipe that you're going to use inside your workshop. And your workshop could limit the diameter of that pipe. I've certainly got problems in this shop for anything wider than 100 millimeters. Then you're looking for the maximum airflow that you're going to get at that port with your chosen diameter of pipe. Learning point number one. Just by comparison, the shop vac, if I was to measure it in meters cubed per hour, a shop vac, that Festool one, is 250 meters cubed per hour. So relatively low, but that's okay, because that's what it's designed for. A low air volume at high speed, lighter chips and dust, directly from this type of device. All of these measurements are all taken directly from the port. Ideal conditions on that port. Now that port needs to connect to your machine and there's a variety of elbows and blast gates and flexible hoses and solid pipes that you're going to use to connect that to your machine. And every one of those devices is going to degrade the airflow inside your system. So the longer you run a pipe, 
the more degradation of airflow you're going to have. The more elbows, the more joints, the more blast gates you get inside that, the more degradation of airflow you're going to have. And that's important to understand. So this is a solid pipe. It's 100 millimeters, and this particular one is one meter long. And if you're going to buy a home kit, this is typically what you're going to have. Now this pipe is going to reduce your airflow into that by 1% for every meter. So if you have 10 of these, you're reducing your airflow by 10%, that's 10 meters. And when you start to think about a pipe going up and along and a pipe coming down, 10 meters is not really that much, but that's gonna take 10% of your airflow away. Now because our pipes come in one meter length, we need a coupler that's going to connect those pipes together. But you're also going to want to have drops so you can bring it down to the machine. So you're likely to also use a Y connector. You may even want to have some sort of elbow device to actually bring down the drop at the end of the overall line. Every one of these is also going to degrade your airflow somewhat. And regardless of whether it's one of these or a designed elbow or a coupler, that's 2%. So if you suddenly have a 10 meter length, you've suddenly got at least 10 of these devices in. So your air, so your air degradation now by 20%. So what was looking really nice here is now beginning to deteriorate as you start to design and install your system. Didn't know that either. Obviously, if you have an open system, this is going to be trying to suck air from multiple ports. And if you had two open ports straight away, you've half the efficiency of this because it will take half from each port. And in reality, when you load one of those ports up with dust, the air's lazy, so it'll go through the open port and you'll actually reduce it even further. So you'd never ever do that on a system. So you tend to use one of these devices. This is known as a blast gate. And it's very, very simple. It seals off when that's closed, when that's open the air can flow through it. That also degrades the port. You can get metal blast gates, obviously are more robust and tend to give you a better seal, I believe, never checked that, but that's what my research told me. And the plastic ones, these are more expensive, these are cheaper, but they both disrupt your airflow, and they're both gonna disrupt your airflow by about 2%. So now I've got a piece of pipe, one meter long, disrupting my airflow by 1% every meter. I've got some couplers, probably one at either end, disrupting by 2% each. I've got a blast gate that's disrupting by a further 2%. So you can start to see how all this comes together, degrading the airflow that you're actually gonna get at your machine. Now the big culprit is this baby here, the flexible pipe. And when you first start to design your system, it's very, very tempting to say, I'll just get a flexible pipe, and I'll put it straight from my machine, straight in to my device. This oh, is a one meter length of flexible pipe. This will degrade your airflow by 10%. And look at it. Now when I plugged this into my planar jointer, I had a two meter length, and that degraded my airflow by 20%. And that's if you manage to keep it straight like this. What tends to happen is it tends to twist and it does all this sort of thing. So there's a good chance that by the time you've done that to an air hose like this, you've disrupted your airflow by up to 20%. So 10% is an ideal condition. So building and designing your system around these, it may not be the best idea. But hey, we need these because we need to connect at some point to our machine and a flex hose just makes that somewhat easier for us. So now we understand that different horsepower devices have different volume throughputs that vary depending on the overall pipe size and we understand that the minute we start to build our system together we're going to degrade our airflow even more. So let's look at the machines. If you look at a typical workshop setup, you're probably gonna have a planar jointer, you might have a bandsaw, you've probably got a router table, you've probably got a table saw, and depending on what you're into, you may also have uh, a lathe in your workshop. All other stuff's available, but that's a typical sort of stack. If you look at the demands, again measured in meters cubed per hour, a planar jointer typically is a thousand meter cubed per hour. A bandsaw is about 500 meter cubed per hour. A router is about 850 meter cubed per hour. And that's a router table that's got the collection box underneath it. A lathe is 1,400. Typically you have a big mouth at the back that tends to just take the chips away that are flicked into it, but mostly they go all over you. 
and the table saw has 1200 meters cubed per hour demand and again that's the table saw where you have the under table collection the box the silo that all the stuff flicks down inside to so let's start to put this into context let's start off with a one horsepower typically this is the device that you're going to have it's designed to sit on a wall it tends to have a nice filter inside it and it has some sort of collection bag and you tend to look at those and you think that's fantastic that's really nice and small it's really nicely compact i can see that working well in my workshop and i thought about that as well the only reason i didn't get this the only reason i didn't get it is that this was a shop display model and it was on offer and therefore it was about the same price as the wall hanging one bit more expensive but about the same price and i just thought to myself, oh i've got a bigger bag and a bigger motor therefore it must be better so if we now take our device it comes in with a thousand millimeter sorry it comes in with a thousand meter cube per hour so if i put if i connect this to a 10 meter run it comes down to 904 meters cubed per hour which is still okay but if you think about some of those workshop demands it's probably not okay enough but then i'm going to connect these pipes together so i'm going to put some couplers in so even if i'm just putting a coupler onto the machine itself so i've not got a pipe run straight away i've degraded this to 980 meters cubed per hour and then as i start to add pipes to the system and therefore more couplers you can see on a 10 meter run i'm down to 886 allowing for the length of the pipe and the numerous couplers i'm going to use and obviously i'm now going to have a blast gate inside here so if i take these figures here and allow for the blast gate at the blast gate point you can see i'm also degrading that even further but your big killer is when I start to put a flex in, sorry that should be a meter, when I start to put my flex holes in, because that's then taking a further 10% from these figures. So if I've got a 10 meter run that's coupled together, that's got a blast gate connection and a flex hose to the machine, I am down to 782 meters cubed per hour at the machine for dust extraction. And I started with a thousand meters cubed. So you can see how much you start to lose on a system. So if you've ever put a system in place and banged your pipes to the wall and turned it on and been disappointed at the dust collection at your machine, that could well be part of the explanation. And although I researched it a lot, I didn't understand that until after the event of buying one. And that's why I wanted to share it with you because it's very tempting to buy that nice wall mounted device. And it's only when you apply it to your situation in your workshop, you know whether that's good enough for you. But you can see the degradation you get on a 10 meter run, which is not long. So now let's apply this to our systems. If I'm going to put my planar jointer on it, and remember my planar jointer needed a thousand meter cube per hour, it's just not going to cut it. Even if I connect this directly in with zero couplers in some way, shape or form into the planar jointer, it's not going to do it. And as I start to connect that to an overall system, there's not enough suction in this to actually meet the demands, the stated demands of my planar jointer. If I'm just using a bandsaw, however, that's quite good and that'll do the job quite well. The router table is pretty borderline, lathe no chance and table saw no chance. So if you wanted my advice, I before I bought anything, I would look at my workshop. I'd look at the devices I want and I'd say, where are those devices going to sit around my workshop? I would then look at the pipe distance, not the direct distance, the pipe distance to wherever that device is going to sit. And, and, and then I'd reverse that, that exercise. If I needed a thousand meter cubed at my planar jointer and my planar jointer was 10 meters away work that backwards what horsepower do i therefore need what suction do i therefore need at my extractor hmm interesting now this is the one that i bought the one and a half horsepower and you can see it's got the bag on top so i obviously upgraded to this filter same idea this is a 1500 meter cube and obviously my pipe degrades that my couplers degrade it my blast gates degrade it and my flexible holes degrade it, but my worst point at 10, at 10 meters is 1,173. So that's actually not bad. That will actually work quite well with my planar jointer. Anywhere between north and seven meters away is probably going to give me a little bit of capacity extra that I need for my planar jointer to work well. Eight to 10 meters is sort of borderline, but it's going to work well for my bandsaw. It's going to work well for my router. It's going to fail miserably at my lathe and it's going to struggle at my table saw but what i can do is position my tools so the bigger demanding beats are closer to this i.e 
there's less waste. And so if I was to take my table saw, that would be my biggest consumer when I finally get one, and if I was to put that no more than one meter away, then I'd probably, probably just about get away with it. By God, it's gonna be borderline. Whereas if I put that same table saw at the end of the run, 10 meters away, it's going to be wholly inefficient. It'll take some dust away and some chips away, but pretty much inefficient for what we need it to do. So the next learning for me will be start to think about the position of your machines in proximity to this. Bigger demand, nearer to your extractor. Smaller demand, further away from your extractor. And couple that with the first piece of learning you have, work out, work out the suction that you need on the overall design of your workshop, allowing for the run of that pipe. Now that's why I say I think I may have bought the wrong machine. And I saw the wall hanging one, I was attracted to it because it was small and compact in my small workshop. But then I bought this one because it was X demo and was on offer and the price was too good to resist. And that was it, that was my buying decision. Think about what we've now learned. The length of the pipe has an impact. The demands of the machine and the location of the machine have an impact. Now if I look at my workshop, this workshop is six meters long, more or less, two and a half meters wide. Not a huge workshop. And then we've got an annex in there that's a further two and a half meters wide and about four meters long. At some point, there'll be some more tools inside there. But just look at this space. If I were going to put a pipe around this room, I'd have six meters pipe there, two and a half meters across there, eight and a half, and probably, let's call it five meters down here, so what, 13 and a half, 14 meters of pipe just to get me the run. That's 14 meters, 14 meters plus 14 couplers. And if I was to put a two meter drop from the pipe down to a blast gate where I'm gonna connect the tools at the worst point, that could well be getting me into the 16 meter territory. And then if I was to have a two meter rise from this port to meet the air duct, I've now got 18 meters. 18 meters and 18 connecting devices and then have a flexible hose from that to the machine so you can see how it very very quickly degrades your airflow so it's worth planning that out before you make your buying decision that's knowledge i wish that i'd have the next one up is the two horsepower 2250 assuming we're using the 175 millimeter pipe and not the 100 millimeter pipe of course and you can start to see this starts to give you usable stuff at so this 10 meter. I'm still in the 2000 meters cubed. And now you can see that that two horsepower is giving me good coverage throughout my workshop, throughout all these devices. So the device I should have bought for this workshop is probably the two horsepower one. Physically, it's not a lot bigger than this, but don't forget the pipe is bigger. 175 millimeters. So to put 175 millimeter run in this workshop will be really, really quite hard to plan it. So I'd have more cost inside this, I'd have more cost inside the pipes and the things that I need to buy. And above this, you've never seen, there's a structure to hold the garage door as a garage door opens up. I'd have to remove all of that and change the garage door in order to install that. So at some point you have a compromise. My, my four big takeaways is there's a big difference between a shop vac and a dust extractor in its simplest form. The second thing is everything that you connect to your dust extractor degrades the airflow and it degrades the airflow considerably. So you need to work out the length of run that's gonna be in your shop, the number of couplers, the number of blast scapes, the number of flexible holes. So you can actually work out the usable airflow at the machines and each machine's got a different demand. The third learning was put your heavier usage machines closer to the air extraction because you're going to get better coverage. And then the fourth learning is everything has got to be a compromise and it's your situation and it's your shop that's going to dictate whether you do what I did. 100 millimeter is my maximum pipe, therefore that dictates the type of device I can use because even if I bought the two horsepower one, remember the airflow is less than the one and a half horsepower one go figure. So that's pretty much it. That's what I wanted to share with you. My learning is how I've been thinking about dust extraction. Oh yeah, there's one final device I have in my workshop that's just worth showing to you. And that's this beast. This is an air filtration system. This is nothing more than a box with some filters on it. 
and inside here there's a motor, not a huge motor, about half a horsepower or so, that's got an impeller built into it. And all that does, it sucks air from this side and it blows it out of that side. And it does it through a two-stage filtration system. This one here and this one here. Now this one is actually a charcoal filter and I chose a charcoal one because that also tends to remove the chemicals in the air so if you're doing finishing in your small space which I tend to do an awful lot that's really really great. I put this on full speed for about four hours and that takes all the air in the shop and it filters it. So any of the dust particles that have been missed by this or you've kicked up by doing something different or any hand signing that's in the air this then takes them out and it's really really nice and when you walk into the shop in the morning and that's been on at the end of the working day and you close the shop up it feels like a spring day you walk in and it's really 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 nice and finally no matter how good your dust cleaner is that your shop vac is your dust extractor is the system you set up this is your ultimate line of defense a simple air mask. This is 3M, you can put different cartridges inside here depending what you're using. So these are general purpose cartridges, you can get cartridges for finishes and so on and so forth. You don't see me using this an awful lot on the videos but when I'm not filming I use this all the time when I'm working with the machines. So that's it, that's my ideal dust extraction system for you. Personal safety equipment, always your first line of defence. Something that's going to keep the air clean at the end of the working day so you're always walking in to a nice environment. A high quality, well designed dust extraction system that allows for the losses in the system that you need to install and then a high quality vacuum based dust extractor such as the Festool or the Bosch range, they're all very very good that filters the air as well and is designed for those sort of power tools. I hope you found this useful, this is information I wish I had before I'd taken the plunge. I think I got away with it but that was more luck than design. So that's it. Um, rest of my day I'm going to clean the shop up because it's a bit messy after some of the big projects I've got. So I'm going to, and I'm going to install my dust extraction system so it works a bit better for me. Not going to video that, there's many videos of people screwing pipes to walls. Might come back and do a quick overview of it when we do shop tour in the future but I don't think there's anything much to see there. And with that said, I'll see you soon.